Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here, and it's a great privilege to be speaking in front of all of you. And thank you, Mr. Howard, for, or Dr. Howard, for your uh, great foundation and for helping us move, move the field forward. I think it's very important. I've been very privileged to be part of this team. What I'm going to present to you is not just my work, but a group of people who were very dedicated. We have uh, an enormous number of investigators, coordinators, and uh, Paul Bernstein is one of our, our, our investigators here and others who really helped us along the road. And, and tomorrow I'm going to uh, more field to speak with Dr. Alan Bird, who is going to help us as well. So we do reach across the, the pond to talk to all of our, our experts to help us in many ways. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, the results of the ARIS-2 study. And I'm going to really go back and, and talk about how we got there in first place. Um, I have no financial interest in this at all, uh, no financial disclosures. And I will talk about the companies who've supported us with studies at the end there. So macular degeneration is the leading cause of blindness in the U.S. and in the developed country. It counts for more than half of blindness, at least in our country, and, and certainly I think in many others as well. And as we age, I think the most as important aspect is this, is that there are a huge number involved already, nearly 9 million people at the, in the U.S. as, as we stand. And 15% of white women over age of 50, 80 years old have some form of a macular degeneration, which is really astonishingly high. But in 2020, AMD will increase by 50%. So we'll have close to 3 million people who will actually have advanced disease in our country. So that's a lot of a large numbers we're talking about. So it's important for us to look at treatments and, 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 more, and more importantly, perhaps prevention. Pathogenesis of AMD is really unknown. Uh, increasing age is a major risk factor. It's probably the most consistent risk factor along with smoking. And the alternative is much worse, so aging is really important. We have to figure out how to deal with it well. Oxidative stress has been, in, has been implicated, and the retina in particular is susceptible to this. Inflammation may play a very important role as well in this condition. Uh, genetics is another important part of the risk factor. Smoking is consistent in all our studies. Uh, every study really talks about and smoking has been a very important aspect in patients with nevascular AMD. Card cardiovascular risk factors are important. But most of all, I'm going to talk about nutritional risk factors today in addition to the uh, fundus uh, features that we have. So as far as back in 1988, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which is an NHANES survey, which is done every several years at the, in, in the U.S., gives us an idea, a snapshot of the health of our nation, looking at diseases as well as nutritional uh, status. At that point in 1988, it was pointed out that a rich diet, rich in fruits and vegetables with vitamin A and C, was inversely associated with macular degeneration. That was actually a very crude sort of diet study that was done. We didn't have fun as photographs. We just had a bunch of residents who looked at the photo, at examined uh, patients in the study. And we came up with a pretty uh, important finding, which has been taken us uh, forward. So the ARIDS is the original study in which the ARIDS-2 is based upon. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on that. This study was conducted as a prospective natural history uh, study. We were interested in looking at cataract and macular degeneration. We started off as a natural history, but soon it became a clinical trial because our investigators were very interested in how we could actually affect the, co the, the course of this condition. So we had, in over the period of six years of the clinical trial starting in 1992 till 2001, we had nearly 5,000 participants. We had less than 2% 2, 2 loss to follow up. We then followed for additionally five more years in what we call an observational study. Those who are surviving and willing to uh, be part of the study, we had a 4% loss to follow up. So these participants were followed to 2005 without the randomization of the study, but just follow up. The randomization consisted of a, what we call a factorial design in which patients were put in placebo, antioxidant, zinc, or the combination. So this is a very effective way of looking at patients. You can usually use half of the population against the other half. So it's actually a very efficient way to, uh, to do trials. At the time when we did this, you know, we're only eye doctors, so we're not nutritional specialists. So we got the nutritional experts to come and give us really a, several workshops, uh, and they were very helpful. At the time, this was a lot, of tri uh, a lot of supplements being tested for cancer and for cardiovascular disease. And hence, we have these large doses of vitamin C, half a gram, vitamin E, 400 international units, and beta carotene, 50 milligrams. During the course of the study, as you well know, there are two large studies conducted by the National Institutes of Health that suggests that beta carotene was actually harmful for patients who were cigarette smokers. And of course, we had to change course during the course of our study uh, for that particular aspect. 
Uh, in, in the late 1980s, Dr. David Newsom had conducted a small study in Utah, about 200 participants looking for MAC degeneration using zinc. High doses of zinc, 80 milligrams, and copper, 2 milligrams, that was given to prevent copper deficiency anemia. And based upon that small study, there were a large number of participants or patients in the, in the public who are using zinc. Although it was a very small study, we were, we were concerned that this was a public health issue. And that was the main rationale for including zinc in the study. And we took that particular dose because that's what he used. We felt that if we didn't do that and we didn't find out any findings, we would just be told that you know he didn't do the right thing. So we promised our data safety monitoring committee that after two years, if there were harmful effects, that we would actually stop the study. Uh, in fact, as you know, there was not a harmful uh, effect, and we continued on using the 80 milligrams of zinc. Because this was a study looking at cataracts as well, we had participants who had no MAC degeneration, so about 1,000 participants had either no drusen or just small hard drusen, 60, less than 63 mic microns. Then the rest of the group were a variety of um, severity of MAC degeneration, patients with multiple small drusen and intermediate-sized drusen in early, lots of intermediate-sized drusen, one large drusen, or multiple large drusen would get you into what's called category three, intermediate drusen, uh, intermediate AMD, which is a highly heter heterogeneous group, and then we have advanced AMD, patients with advanced knee vascular AMD or geographic atrophy centrally in one eye. And the fellow eye was the study eye. So this is category three and four we talked about. And we going in, we knew that the rate of the category two going to advanced disease was extremely low. We're very interested in mostly category threes and four and what the results might be in this case. So this is a, what we looked for. This is photographic uh, Gradings that we did, fundus photographs were conducted on a yearly basis. We saw patients every six months for the first five years. If they had an event, they had any vascularization or geographic atrophy, a photograph was taken. So we looked for baseline at three years, you see there was a progression to knee vascular AMD. And this may be the last study in which you have natural history of knee vascular AMD, because shortly after the end of the study, uh, the anti-VEGF therapies came along and we don't have the similar sort of findings anymore. So fibrosis, for example, you don't see anymore. So this is a natural history of baseline with large drusen going to fibrosis and nevascular AMD. And geographic atrophy from uh, large drusen again to areas of, of loss of geographic atrophy and, cal and calcific drusen seen in this area. And you can see that geographic atrophy took a little longer time. That was seven years for it to get to that stage. So again, we had this randomized trial and we were looking at comparisons of basically antioxidant versus placebo, zinc versus placebo, and the combination. So we had three different groups comparing to placebo, and that was our, our analysis that we were looking at. This is the, the, the primary outcome that we, we actually described in 2001. Uh, and uh, more than 12 years ago. And again, we're looking at categories threes and fours, participants who were at risk for macular degeneration, people with bilateral large drusen or advanced disease in one eye. So this is a perfect factorial result in the sense that each individual, antioxidants alone in green and zinc alone, actually had a, a beneficial effect. But the combination was the best. So the combination of both antioxidants and zinc reduced the risk of macular degeneration, development advanced disease, 20% versus 28%, and that's a 25% reduction in the risk of advanced macular degeneration. We then follow these participants through for another five years. And interestingly, what happened was at five year, at, after the five years, six and a half years of follow-up, for the, for the next two years, we did not have any antioxidants or, or minerals to give them because the, the ARIDS supplement was not available. So for two years, neither the placebo or the treated group actually were, were treated. Uh, and this was then resumed, and then all the placebo group were given th the treatments. So they were no longer blinded. Patients were all taking the supplements. Despite that, at 10 years, you see a separation of 34% going to advanced disease in the combination versus 44% in the placebo group. So there was a 27% reduction that persisted over time uh, for the an antioxidant and the, and the zinc, the ARITS supplement or ARITS formulation. So this is remarkable, and we were particularly pleased to see this because, as in most studies, it's good to see when you have a replicate study, and there is no way we're going to be repeating another ARID study. First of all, it's become a standard of care. It would be difficult for us to, it would not be feasible to do another study. And the fact that we see the long-term effects was very reassuring for us. 
I just want to show you that we're going to do a lot of hazard ratio trees. I want to explain to you what it means, and this will be make, make my presentation a little easier for you to understand. So the hazard ratio, ratio is the estimate is the point estimate as to what that treatment effect might be. Is it less than one or greater than one? If it's less than one, it usually favors treatment. If it's greater than one, it favors placebo. And this bracket is a 95% confidence interval. If it brackets one, it includes one, it means it's not statistically significant. But if it on the one side of one, such as is here, it's in favor of treatment. If it's on the other side of one, it's statistically significant, it's in favor of the placebo. So that's the hazard tree that we're going to be using quite a bit. So in this case, after 10 years, this is what we find. So this is a hazard tree for 10 years of treatment in the ARID study. You see that for a group of advanced AMD, which combines neovascular GA and GA together, the combination in blue shows that this is, it clears one, it's clearly beneficial, so the ARIS formulation reduces the risk of um, advanced macular generation by 27%. And not too far behind are the antioxidants, and zinc just barely clears it, uh, doesn't quite. For nevascular AMD, you see the similar sort of thing, and most of the treatment effect, there's in fact a shifting of the estimate further to further uh, protection. And geographic atrophy, all three actually bridges one, so it's not statistically significant. So we do not have a, a treatment effect for geographic atrophy in this, in this uh, at least, analysis. So who should be taking the ARIDS formulation? Well, participants with intermediate AMD, but, but a large drusen, patients with advanced AMD in one eye, and certainly not for current smokers, and that's what we recommended at the time of the study. And often we're asked, should offsprings of affected individuals be taking ARIDS formulation? And our answer has been no, because ARIDS formulation does not prevent early AMD from progressing to the more severe uh, aspect of AMD. And so unless they have bilateral large drusen, we recommend that they don't take it, or unless they have advanced disease in one eye. So their answer for them is they should have regular eye exams and be treated. Just, just as, as Stuart said, people should have regular eye exams and be followed very carefully uh, for potential risks. And should the ARIDS formulation be taken for general eye health? Probably not, because we don't really, really can't prevent the earlier stages. Uh, it doesn't prevent cataract progression, so perhaps it's not the right place for us. But is it okay for the ARIDS formulation to be taken with a multivitamin? In our study, two-thirds of our patients were given Centrum, and we did, we did this to standardize their intake so we don't have things all over the map. And Centrum was provided also to give such as D and B complex, and we actually found that there was no effect either with or without Centrum. So Centrum had no effect on AMD, although it did have effect on cataract. When we did our studies using a propensity score, it seemed to have a protective effect for cataract surgery and cataract itself, and in fact, a larger study showed that cataract uh, was actually prevented by Centrum in the nuclear part, but unfortunately, posterior subcapsular was a little bit uh, increased by that. So the most common question that's been asked following all of that was, what is the role of lutein in the therapy of AMD? Lutein was our, the original, original really Krotner that we were most interested in during the time of the ARIS study, but that was not available clinically, so we were not able to use it. So as, as we know, this has become available. There's a lot of biological reasons for it. This is Max's um, wonderful slide showing the, the importance of the macular pigment and how important lutein zeaxanthine might be in the study. So it's a major component, so we're very interested in seeing whether that would be very important for either antioxidant stress or blocking blue light and other things. So we looked at the ARIS data for further evaluation to see whether we have any hints from it. We did a, uh, a dietary questionnaire, and we looked at baseline AMD status as well as, as it went on. Uh, this was a, 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 an NCI Cancer Institute food frequency questionnaire designed by uh, Gladys Block. We have since then used now, uh, the one in ARIS2 is by Walter Willett, so we slightly different uh, dietary questionnaires. These were self-ministered, 90 items were asked at the time, asking them what did they eat in the past year. And with all things, your recall, my recall may be just as good, so it's very hard to say well, what do people actually use. So the best is using the very extremes. People who don't eat fish will tell you they don't eat fish. People who eat a lot of fish will tell you that. So we've always used the extremes, the top quintile and the, and the bottom quintile to do the comparisons. So when we did that, we did a, a case control study. So the controls are those who did not have macular generation at baseline. It's about 1,000 participants. At baseline, there are a number of people with large drusen, people with geographic atrophy or advanced nevascular AMD, or those with medium-sized drusen. 
and we compare always to the control, looking at patients with disease and without disease, and looking at the quintiles of, uh, of, the, of the dietary intake. And the two things that popped up, of course, were lutein zeaxanthine, which is found in spinach, kale, and collard green. And now, listening to John, I have to add watercress to this as well, too. Um, Omega-3 was another important aspect that was uh, found to be. But those are two top nutrients that actually popped up in our analysis. Of course, this was not new. A number of other studies also found that, starting from Johanna Seddon's work in our eye disease case in 1993, we knew lutein was very important. So this was just a confirmation of other studies. Well, the relationship of this was explored, and we found that uh, if, some numbers for this now. So the odds ratio of having knee vascular AMD, if you compare patients who had the highest intake versus the lowest intake of dietary uh, lutein zeaxanthine at baseline, so in other words, this is knee vascular AMD is protective, or odds ratio 0.65, geographic atrophy even greater, 0.45 in large Jews and 0.73. And here's the hazard ratio tree showing that geographic atrophy, which is highly I mean, statistically significant here shows that this is protected by, a, a, as I said, odds ratio 0.45, a 55% reduction in the risk of having geographic atrophy at baseline. This is a broader confidence interval. So there are fewer cases in this, in this particular analysis. And in large Drusen and nevascular AMD were also found to be in the protective fashion. So lutein cesanthine clearly had a beneficial effect uh, associated with this. This is observational. We cannot say you, we would recommend this based upon these data. And when we looked at omega-3, we found similar finding at baseline. Uh, it was an almost 40% reduction in the risk of having nevascular AMD. And even incident cases, new cases of geographic atrophy or advanced AMD was also beneficial with higher levels of omega-3, the highest quintile versus the lowest quintile. Uh, and th these were pretty compelling data, and this had been seen in other studies as well. So the design of the ARITS-2 was based upon this, and we looked at, a, again, a factorial design. We looked at Santafil's lutein zeaxanthine, 10 milligrams and 2 milligrams. At the time when this was done, we, uh, we, were, we were very fortunate. We were given uh, DSM supported us and gave us the drugs for our initial uh, dosing studies. We looked 5 milligrams and 10 milligrams. This was done well before the ARITS-2 in 2006. We were told that more than 10 milligrams would be toxic. We couldn't go further than that. When we did our serum studies, we found that the 10 milligrams did indeed more than double our serum levels of lutein. We felt that was really sufficient to, to really treat our patients. And zeaxanthine was giving 2 milligrams because of the natural occurrence in food of a 5 to 1 ratio, and that's why we use 10 milligrams and 2 milligrams. Our omega-3 experts said that we could do 1 to 3 grams, which be, would be sufficient. Uh, and the DHA-EPA ratio was, was not particularly important, and whether that's true or not is something we need to discuss perhaps later. Uh, certainly, that was what came out of our discussions with our nutritional experts. And from that, we had 82 uh, clinical centers, both academic and community centers were involved. So this is a little bit more broader than our ARITS-1, which only had 11 centers. We had the Midwest and the more of the West and the South involved. So this is much more generalizable than perhaps than ARITS-1 in that sense. We also know that from ARITS-1, we could use the data for progression rate. There are very few clinical trials where you actually know how fast people are going to progress and use it to do, do an accurate uh, sample size calculation. And in fact, our sample size calculation was right on the money. When we thought the event rate would be a certain amount, that was exactly what it was when we did it with, with these data. So we took only patients who were at high risk, those with bilateral large drusen, patients with advanced disease in one eye, either geographic atrophy or nevascular AMD. So these are patients with category threes and fours, purely threes and fours, so there, we don't have the ones and twos. So when you try to compare ARITS-1 to ARITS-2, you cannot do that because they're just different population. They're much, the, the category threes in ARITS-1 in ARITS was much more heterogeneous. They were much younger patients. In fact, our population is 10 years older than the ARITS-1, so the comparison of the race may, make, may be very difficult to do. We're also interested in, uh, in really refining our ARITS formulation because there were a lot of concerns about beta carotene having, uh, and not being able to be given it to patients who are smokers. And zinc at 80 milligrams was considered to be very high. Uh, some of our nutritional experts felt that was much too high, even though we didn't find much in ways of adverse effect in ARITS-1, other than greater hospitalizations for genital urinary problems in that study. 
So the secondary ionization, we were interested in looking at the ARIDS formulation and how we can actually affect that. So we gave one group the classic ARIDS formulation, which had everything that we tested before. We then eliminated beta carotene in one formulation. We lowered the zinc in another, and then in the third, third one, we actually did both elimination of the, of the beta carotene as well as lowering the zinc. So smoke groups can be randomized to these two arms because of the fact that they cannot be taken beta carotene. So you'll see that th those two arms will have slightly larger number of uh, patients in that study. So the secondary randomization is the modification of ARIDS formulation. And this is what's really important for us to understand. We don't have a really placebo group. These participants, everyone who's in the study, gets the ARIDS formulation in addition. Some may get the ARIDS formulation in this randomized part, or they might get ARIDS minus beta carotene, or ARIDS with beta carotene but low zinc, but here ARIDS minus beta carotene and low zinc. So some modification of ARIDS formulation is given to everyone, so this is not a placebo control in that sense. And this, you can see that's why it's called a, a control. But everyone in the study will be randomized to one of these four. So they have to be randomized, and then we ask them whether they would be willing to be randomized to the secondary part. So the statistical analysis, we took this, our, our data safety monitor committee wanted us to do it very similar to what we did for ARITS-1. Uh, and so we would assume that this treatment effect is on top of the ARITS formulation. Remember, ARITS formulation already give you 25% treatment effect already. We're looking for an effect above and beyond that. And we're assuming an additional 25% reduction for the progression of advanced AMD with an alpha of 0.013. And again, we're looking at this individually, lutein c xanthine versus placebo, DHA versus placebo, and the combination. So this is, this is our primary analysis that we, st we stated we would do. With intention to treat, each unit analysis was done by eye, and we did a timed event looking at Cox proportional hazards ra ratio here. And again, the, the, the hazard tree, we're using that again, showing that this side to the left would be favoring treatment, to the right would be favoring placebo. Anything that covers one, including one, would be uh, would be not statistically significant, and, and the hazard ratios, as we say there. So our primary uh, outcome was to look at progression advanced AMD, just as we did for ARITS-1. And this is based upon fundus photographs that are done on an annual basis, uh, and patients were followed for five years. Secondary analysis include progression to moderate vision loss, that's three-line loss, going from 2020 to 2040, or 2040 to 2080. Progression to advanced AMD stratified by dietary intake, depending on what they were taking and how much they were e eating. We're looking at time to cataract surgery. Uh, as we know, lutein zeaxanthine is actually in the lens, and there are observational data suggesting that higher intake of dietary lutein zeaxanthine reduces the risk of cataract and progression of the lens opacity itself. And the results, as you many know already from our ARVO presentation, was published in the JAMA at the day of our publication, and it was then in print on, Jan on May 15, 2013. So this is our very complicated design. It's, 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 it's mind-boggling and a little bit daunting. I'm going to break it down for you once more to just emphasize the things that we need to look for. So this is the primary randomization in which all patients are randomized to one of four groups. So it's a factorial design in that half of the participants are taking lutein zeaxanthine, the other half are taking DHA EPA. So that's the efficiency of the, of the two by two factorial design. That's what's the primary randomization. Everyone needs to be, they have to consent to this randomization. The secondary randomization is the following. You know, we've asked them whether they'd be willing to take another randomization so we can test the ARIDS formulation. Some of them said, no, I don't like that. I want to stick with it. And this is this group of over 1,000 participants here. So they're not randomized. They're not in our analysis because they're not randomized. 19 patients could not tolerate ARIDS formulation, so they're also not in the randomization. The remaining 3,000 were given ARIDS, the classic ARIDS formulation, or that minus beta carotene, uh, plus low zinc, or the combination of the two. So you see that these two are a little bit higher because there's no beta carotene. 
those extra people are people who are smokers we can put in the study. So when we do certain analysis, we exclude the smokers because it's not fair to put smokers in some of these analyses, and that's what we're going to talk about. So this is the secondary randomization that we're talking about, and only 3,000 participants are in this study. So it gives you an idea what we did with this. So it's comp complex. Of 5,000 participants that were screened, we enrolled 4,203 in a matter of two years. It was pretty rapid. We had a great team that did very quickly. 3% lost to follow-up, and 6% died over the course of the, of the, of the study. And the median follow-up is about five years. The study ended in October 2012 with the start in 20, 2006. The majority of the participants were white, as you expect. This is a disease of a white Caucasian population. Our, mean, our medium age was 74 years, which is almost a decade older than those patients in ERITS-1. As in most studies, 57% were female, 13% had diabetes, this is a little more than ERITS because it's an older population, and 50% were former smokers and 7% are current smokers. And this is actually a little lower than the general population. The general population for this age group is at least 60% who are former smokers. Our AMD status, two-thirds of them had bilateral large drusen, about a third had advanced disease in one eye. And in terms of cataracts, we had approximately 75% of participants who had at least one lens in their eye, another one quarter who had, who had bilateral uh, pseudophagia, so they were not eligible for the cataract study. How well did we do in terms of keeping our patients on the medication? How well did they tolerate it? Well, 7% of the primary randomization actually discontinue, which is a pretty low rate, so that's a pretty good rate. 6% discontinue the secondary randomization, and we found that 84% continue to take at least three quarters of their study supplements. So that's a fairly good, that's a very high uh, area of compliance for, for this particular uh, type of supplement. Of course, this is, you know, in the market, people can pick it up. It's not like we have to go to the pharmacy and, and be prescribed by their physician. So 3% were taking lutein, zeaxanthin on their own, which is low, and 11% took DHA, EPA on their own. Again, we want to just see what was our population like. So the ERIS-2 dietary intake and serum levels were studied at the beginning. The Harvard Dietary Assessment by Walt Willett was conducted, and we did baseline administration. This is a highly nourished cohort. When we look at our group compared to N. Haynes, our lower, lower you know, quintile is in the upper fourth and fifth quintile of the general population in N. Haynes. We've looked at large populations. Uh, they're studying about 18 of them. Again, we're t high up in the top, very top part. So these are also a highly educated group. Serum levels were done at baseline and one, three, and five years for compliance. We also want to compare this to the, uh, to the NHANES a sur a survey. Again, the statistically significantly higher in ERITS too. So in other words, we are very well nourished in this, in this population. We also administered two carotenoids simultaneously, beta carotene, lutein, zeaxanthine, or at least a xanthophyll and a carotenoid. Uh, and we found an increase, a oh, two-fold increase in lutein, zeaxanthine supplement group. This increased less when we gave beta carotene. And this is probably due to uh, competitive inhibition. So here I can, I can show you some numbers here. This is at five years. This is the group, they're all given lutein zeaxanthine, but some were given beta carotene and some were not. Those who were given beta carotene, you can see with the highest level, and this also depends on your HD levels, whether how well you absorb the, the lutein zeaxanthine. So I've given them in separate groups of H, HDL at baseline. You can see that for the highest level of HDL, which ha had the highest absorption of lutein zeaxanthine, at five years, if you're given beta carotene, your level was considerably high, lower than that of those who were not given beta carotene. So there was an inhib inhibition of the lutein uptake by simultaneously taking beta, beta carotene, which we need to take into account. So the primary analysis, which was looking really at only half the population at the time, you can see that uh, this was very close, or, you know, ranging from 29 to 30 to 31 percent. So patients given the placebo group was 31 in this tangerine color, orange color. Lutein in yellow was 29 percent, progressing to advanced macro generation in, at five years. And lutein zeaxanthine, uh, or lutein and, and, and um, the combination, uh, it was the green, uh, you can see it's about 30 percent, and DHI EPA is sort of 31 percent. So there is not much difference between the two. Uh, or between all the treatment effects. Again, this was the primary analysis looking at lutein versus placebo, uh, fish oil versus placebo, and the combination. So this is the primary analysis, which only uses, I said, 
2,000 participants at a time. That was what we specify as our primary analysis. And this is the hazard tree showing that although they are in the direction of, of favoring treatment, they're not statistically significant because they crossed one um, in, in, this, in this hazard ratio tree. What is more important is our subgroup analysis. Our, this is again, this was pre-specified, but this was not our primary analysis. Here we're using the whole study population, all 4,000 participants. And what we do here is we compare participants who were randomized to lutein zeaxanthine, that's 1,000 in each group, so it's 2,000 participants. We compare them to people who were not randomized to lutein zeaxanthine. That's the other 2,000 participants. So we've doubled our sample size. We have 4,000 participants. And this is called the main effects, which is done in all factorial design studies. And this is just a normal thing we do. You can see now that lutein zeaxanthine actually crosses one, no, no, no longer bridges one, but on the other side of favoring treatment. Uh, and DHI EPA, although favoring this, is still uh, bridges one. Low zinc, high zinc shows that high zinc is favorable compared to low zinc. Again, this is not statistically significant because it bridges one. Beta carotene, yes or no, it favors no beta carotene, and it, again, bridges one is not statistically significant. So those are the main effects of the all four nutrients that we actually study. We then drill down even further. Uh, and we looked then at the comparison. Of course, this is the hazard ratio I just showed you, that it's about 10% additional reduction on the risk of progression of advanced AMD with lutein zeaxanthine. This is on top of the ARID supplement uh, effect. So the other hazard ratios were not statistically significant. We then looked at participants by their dietary intake. The lowest quintile is, lowest, is, is, is one, and, and the highest is five. In our particular dietary in, uh, intake, this would be someone taking half a cup of spinach, cooked spinach, almost five times a week. This is the lowest, is probably less than half a cup to the whole week, whole week. So there's quite a bit of difference between the two. Again, you see that this hazard ratio is 0.74, clears one, uh, and it's statistically significant. It favors lutein zeaxanthine. So for, for people who have, take very low dietary intake of lutein zeaxanthine, there's a 26% reduction in the risk of advanced macrogeneration when given lutein zeaxanthine uh, with or without beta carotene. Now, if we then look at the two particular advanced diseases that we talked about, geographic atrophy and nevascular AMD, we were exploring to see whether there were any differences because ARITS-1, we found some differences. You can see that this is driven by the nevascular AMD. So here, the, most of this, this treatment effect is found mostly in the nevascular. Geographic atrophy also is favored, but not statistically significant. And this hazard ratio is about 0.89, so 11% reduction in the risk of progression to advanced disease, nevascular AMD, uh, with lutein zeaxanthine. The most important one that we were really interested in was what would happen if you replace lutein uh, we place beta carotene with lutein, and this is a head-to-head -head comparison. We do have that because patients with ARITS formulation with beta carotene, uh, it's about 680 participants, and we compare them to those who take given lutein, but with an ARITS formulation without beta carotene. So you're substituting the lutein for the beta carotene. That comparison is looking at what we really wanted to do in the first place was to put lutein into the ARITS formulation. And when you do that, you see that the uh, that there is a, a, a difference in, in the treatment and it's statistically significant. 30% of those who were given lutein without beta carotene advanced to uh, uh, advanced AMD. Whereas 34% in those given beta carotene uh, went on to advanced AMD. And what did this mean in terms of hazard ratios? So advanced AMD, the combination of the two was 0.82. Nevasco AMD was 0.78. Those two, again, to the left of one, is statistically significant, and geographic atrophy, which partly because this is a small size. This is a much smaller sample size. You can tell by the large 95% confidence interval. So it's quite possible it could be partly because of small sample size. We couldn't find a statistical significance there. But you can see that there is now about 22% reduction in the risk of progression of nevascular AMD with lutein zeaxanthine, about 18% to advanced disease. So around 20% reduction in the risk of advanced AMD, especially nevascular AMD with lutein zeaxanthine. That, again, is on top of the ARIS formulation. We had pre-specified, when we looked at visual acuity, 
of 10 letter loss or 15 letter loss, these two are pre-specified. We added these two post hoc because we're interested because we want to know, especially if it's knee vascular AMD, did we prevent more severe vision loss? So 30 letter loss is quite severe. That's quite a bit of vision loss. And 2100, worse than 2100, is in our books a legal blindness. So these are statistically and rather clinically important outcomes for a patient. You can see that when we do this, just looking at lutein, versus no lutein, that's using the 2,000 patients versus the 2,000 patients, we find that there is, there is some beneficial effect but not statistically significant because they all bridge one. However, when we look again at just a head-to-head -head comparison of lutein versus beta carotene using those 680 patients in each group, you see that we find that, that even visual acuity, we find that there is a beneficial effect in those participants who are given lutein versus no lutein especially in this case versus beta carotene. So this vision loss, a 16% re reduction in the risk of progression to, uh, um, to vision loss and an 18% reduction in the risk of uh, progression. And just change gears very quickly, we'll talk about the cataract aspect of this. We were only interested in lutein and zeaxanthin. That was our main goal. We know going in that omega-3 was not going to really affect our, our cataracts. So we looked purely at lutein and zeaxanthin. And here you see that there was actually no treatment effect. Again, it favors lutein and zeaxanthin, but it was not statistically significant. However, when we looked at cataract surgery or progression of any cataract or more severe cataract, those in the lowest quintile of dietary intake, there was a treatment effect and into a, to a point of 0.64 hazard ratio. So this is somewhat interesting, but this is secondary analysis, so this needs much further evaluation in the future. Safety outcome, have we hurt our patients in any way with our treatments? And this is looking at mortality. This is the main effect as well as each individual group, so that's why there's so many numbers on here. We looked at lutein versus placebo, that small group, you see that Again, it's close to one, uh, and, and there's really very little, in this case, DHA and EPA jump up a little bit, but in, in, in all of these analyses, none of them are statistically <coughs> significant, so there was no risk of increasing mortality. So there was no statistically significant differences in serious of, uh, events between the treatment groups. Analysis were conducted for the non-smokers or former smokers for lung cancer for beta carotene, because those are the only ones who were randomized to that. When we did that, we see that there was a doubling of the risk of lung cancer, and 91% of those were in participants who were former smokers. So this an analysis excludes people who are smokers, so we found that beta carotene does increase the risk of your former smoker, uh, particularly. We looked for lutein and zeaxanthin, whether that had an increased risk for lung cancer, and we found they were identical, 1.5%. These, of course, include patients who, had, who were smokers as well. So this is a, a very complex design involving a secondary randomization and a number of secondary analysis. Uh, our patient population is highly nourished, very, very well nourished, highly educated group. Uh, there may be competitive absorption of carotenoids going on in this study. The strengths are that it's a low attrition rate, there's consistently good adherence to treatment regimen, which is a, a, a good thing for the study. So we found that the addition uh, of lutein cisanthine did not have an effect on cataract progression or cataract surgery in general, and whether it could reduce the risk for developing opacities in persons with lower intake of dietary intake of lutein cisanthine really needs a further research uh, in the future. As far as the three active arms in the primary analysis, we did not reach a statistical significance, but the addition of lutein cisanthine to the ARIS formulation as analyzed by the main effects had additional 10% decrease in risk of progression to macular degeneration, and was no main effect in eff with efficacy in DHA and EPA. Our secondary analysis, and we have a number of actually, in addition to these ones that we've actually done, that sort of gives us a, a, a total story that looks like uh, that, that there, there's really, a, I think, a role for eliminating beta carotene. Um, and certainly, there are no differences in beta carotene or, or lowering zinc. In fact, it's favored not having beta carotene in our study. Lowering zinc um, may not, we don't, really don't know for sure. Uh, and no differences in adverse side effects. So the high zinc was favored in the hazard tree, but no real differences between the two that we would say. Um, the main effect of lutein zeaxanthin demonstrated 10% reduction, but when we looked very specifically at lutein versus beta carotene, uh, and we looked without the beta carotene effect that there was almost a 20% reduction in the risk of progression to advanced disease. And this was particularly true for nevascular AMD in the head-to-head -head comparison with beta carotene. 
And I think, you know, we've concluded to improve the safety of air supplement. We like to remove the beta carotene and to decrease the risk of lung cancer in smokers and former smokers who make up more than 50% of our, our study group uh, with MAC degeneration and maybe even higher in the general population. And we consider the totality of evidence, not just secondary analysis, but all the, all the all analysis we've done, it seems to be appropriate to substitute uh, beta carotene with lutein zeaxanthine in the ARIDS formulation. And so this would look something like this. We'd get rid of beta carotene, would not include omega-3, but add lutein zeaxanthine to the current uh, zinc, you know, we prefer to stick with the 80. I think the, one can argue that perhaps even lower zinc might be reasonable uh, because we don't have data suggesting one or the other might be better. But despite all this, I think what we learned from this is that we have to maintain for our patients that you have to maintain a healthy diet, replete with even fish. Omega-3 didn't work, but what's important the fish? The data observation ads is so compelling that fish is really important. We don't know what are the components of fish that we haven't tested that may be important. Green leafy vegetables, color vegetables, all the vegetables that, that, that John talked about yesterday. Stop smoking, that's really important. And consider the air supplement with lutein zeaxanthine uh, for those with that lateral large drusen or advanced AMD in one eye. We still have a great deal of work to do. We have um, a number of fundus autofluorescence. We follow our patients through in four clinics. They're about uh, close to a uh, or actually, there's more than four clinics, about 2,000 participants who've actually had fundus autofluorescence all the way through. At the end of the study, we did a large capture of everybody with fundus autofluorescence, so that'll be very helpful for us to look at what the data shows. We have four clinics. We've had OCTs serially, so those very important to understand what happens to AMD over time. We've done the optos fundus images, which is a large, wide angle looking at peripheral drusen. How does that fit into it? Macro pigment measurements are being done. Paul is leading the, the, the field in that. We have 2,000 genetic uh, associations to look at. We have 2,000 DNA samples, that is, looking at genetic associations. It would be very important looking at response to treatment, um, aspects of progression. We also get cognitive function testing, both for, you know, obviously lutein and omega-3 is important to look at that, and cardiovascular disease. So those are things that we're working very hard on to getting the data out to you. Uh, plus, there's a number of other secondary analysis that we've, we have planned. So we have enough work to do for the next two or three years at least. So we're looking forward to bringing you more information on that. I'd like to thank the National Institute who funded the study. We had the coordinating center at MS and the Fundus Reading Center. Central Lab, the CDC, and the Drug Distribution Center. Uh, this, as I say, this is a huge team. It's not me. It's my team who's been fantastic. The ARIS2 participants themselves, investigators, the DSMC, the operations committee who worked monthly and sometimes on a daily basis to make sure that the study goes on smoothly, and the clinical site personnel, which number in the hundreds of people who really helped us with this. And finally, I'd like to thank the sponsors who gave us a very generous donation to study supplements, including Alcon, Bosch & Lohm, DSM, and Pfizer, uh, who provided the Centrum. So thank you very much for your attention, and thank you for this great honor of being here. <laughs> a questions? Are you happy for questions? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, we have time for some questions, but thank you very much for presenting such a, a big and important and complicated study in such a brilliant way. We, we appreciate it. Toss. Um, you showed that uh, it's the geographic atrophy. There are really no effects, or hardly any. Is this just a matter of numbers, or is there? It could be a matter of numbers. As I say, you know, it it it's in a favor, you know, favoring treatment. But we had much smaller number of geographic atrophy. We had more than double the the neovascular AMD. So that could be part of it. And we didn't find anything in our ten-year study for ARITS two, ARITS one also. So is that true? So the question then is, do you not give it to people with geographic atrophy? That's a very good question. So we've looked at our data, and in ARITS-1, you know, we don't, come, we don't come in with the geographic atrophy branded on your forehead, say, I've got GA. What happens is 30% of patients actually get nevascular AMD in addition to GA. So it's always a combination. So I think it's behoove us to give it to everyone, even they have GA. We don't know what's going to help, but, but it might prevent nevascular AMD in those people who would develop nevascular AMD. Then you said, uh, if I may, of course, st stop smoking. And I can imagine that it's, uh, it, it's healthy and you should stop smoking, but you should not start smoking. By 20 years ago, probably. Yeah, but uh, if imagine uh, somebody coming in in your practice uh, at 75 years of old having uh, a neovascular AMD, will he 
be helped by stopping smoking at that That's time? That's a very good question. It, it may not do much to help him, but perhaps it would still help his cardiovascular disease and other things. But on the other hand, I think the stopping smoking, you're right, it should be even a further message further back. It should be a public health problem. Just as Stuart talked about, we got to be talking about healthy lifestyles. People should be doing that. They can prevent so much disease by stopping smoking. Um, you know, in, in Australia, I know you have a, a campaign. Uh, Hugh Taylor told me how they got these great advertisements showing, you know, frying your frying two fried eggs. If you smoke, you're frying your eyes. So I think that's a great thing to to tell people. We've done it. We've done a, um, a a questionnaire to the American public and asking them how they feel about their vision. In addition to a number of questions, and 70% of them would say they would give up a limb life for vision. Vision is so important to these people. So I think it's important, you know, when you're young, you don't realize these things. So the education, public health education is enormously important. Dietary aspects, you know, really preaching good dietary habits from the very beginning, uh, as well as smoke, stopping smoking. Uh, you may be right, it should be much further on, earlier on than rather at this stage. 75-year-old, maybe not quite as important. Any other questions? Um, so DHA has been found in many prospective cohort studies to reduce re risk of advanced AMD, but there's no main effect in the A-RACE trial. Um, do you mind just comment on that? Say, say the first part again. I missed the first part. Sorry. Uh, I mean, like DHA and oh, DHA. Yeah. Yes. So uh, that's a very good point. Why didn't DHA not work in our study? Um, you know, was it too small of a dose? Was it too late? Was the ratio not right? Uh, we didn't. You know, we had. Uh, unusual ratio because DHA was much lower than the EPA. EPA was 650 and DHA was 350. So I don't think we'll ever know. Uh, and unfortunately, we're not going to be able to do another study. So we looked at quintiles. We looked at serum levels to see whether we could tease that out. We still didn't find anything in DHA. We turned that, that data upside down. So I think it's quite plausible that we haven't captured what's important in fish for us. We eat foods. We don't eat just nutrients, so the foods is really important. So I think it's very important for us to continue to tell our patients you should eat fish because that data is so compelling that I do tell them, you know, we didn't get DHA EPA, it didn't work, but doesn't mean you should stop eating fish. Fish is still very important for you. And what's also interesting is I'm looking at the data very carefully because we're doing the cardiovascular paper. There are a number of negative studies from the cardiovascular data now. The meta-analysis was negative. Mm -hmm. I've had two or three randomized trials in which DHI EPA, much higher doses than ours. But there are cardiovascular disease studies that have been done same dose as ours that haven't shown anything as well. So it's possible that the initial studies were done 10 years ago. Uh, more than 10 years ago, were in Italy, and at the time there were people who probably were not as well treated with, with the statins, because the statins now, I think so many people are on statins, their cholesterol is much better, their hypertension is much better, so there's better medical care, and maybe that's why we're not seeing the effects. So, so there are various reasons why that's, that's happening, but, but I, I think fish is compelling, very compelling still. Okay, we have a question up top. Did you, did you look into Concomitant medications, yeah. So concomitant medications is something we did collect a lot of information on. We haven't done all our analysis on that yet, but our, cur our crucial, just sort of very cursory look, there wasn't anything that came out. Because, you know, we, we did our initial analysis. We looked things like um, uh, Tums, for example, calcium supplements and things came up. But when you, do the second, when you do the multivariate analysis, they all go away. So we really didn't find anything. But aspirin is something we're going to look at very carefully because that's, that's a very important thing that people are very interested in. Our initial analysis, looking at the baseline and looking at ERITS-1, we found no association, increased risk of AMD with aspirin. And we're now going to do a propensity score. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that means, it means you know propensity score is like a, a, like a, a, a poor man's way of making a clinical trial. So you try to, compare, try to pair people off so that they look like they're on a level playing field so you can actually compare them and see whether aspirin really makes an effect. And I think a lot of studies that have been done shows that aspirin is associated because they cannot actually uh, tease out the confounding from the cardiovascular disease. People are indicated to have aspirin, and cardiovascular disease and AMD are, are correlated. So, okay. um, Randy Hammond. So, uh, very, very nice talk. And I, I have to say, the, the reason I understand the study is because I've heard the talks. Yes. And uh, when, I, when I first read the paper, I was, I was very confused. And I, I think one of the reasons I was confused is 
sort of like you started the talk saying there was no placebo control, and then throughout the talk, you talked about a placebo control. And I, I remember reading the abstract and saying, oh, okay, there was no effect of lutein and zeaxanthin. And then later reading the paper and going, oh, there was an effect of lutein. So it, it was very confusing very the way confusing. it was I, written. I, and I, and I, I'm, I'm, I guess my question is why that strategy was chosen. Yeah, you, you know, you, you pinpoint that very well. And, and it's, it's, it's embarrassing for us in many ways because uh, I know Paul and I have been through this. And, you know, the, the, JAMA, the JAMA paper, we start off with JAMA, and they're very strict. And, you know, New England Journal of Medicine, we've, we've written, paper, written papers with them, and it's really, they base it on your, what we call your statistical analysis plan, which was based on those small little 2,000 patient studies that we're, we're comparing. So when we show them the, the SAP, they said, well, you've got to stick with that. You can't say anything more. Uh, you know, in the abstract, we did get that one thing in about lutein zeaxanthin. They weren't even allow us to do that. So there was a, it, was, it was the way that these, you know, they've, they've been burnt because clinical trials have been reported in a, in a funny way. So in our study, we're looking on top of the ARID supplement. So part of this was our fault for not having DSMC. Uh, giving DSMC telling us we had to do that. We actually did fight that at the beginning. They said, oh no, you should do what the errors did. But that was wrong because we you know clearly you want to see what the whole effect might be. We're looking on top of an errors supplement. We're not just looking at you know one thing at a time. So that was our big mistake. We really did make a big mistake with that. So we're hoping that we'll have changed this error by submitting a paper that's doing all the secondary analysis in archives. And, and basically, it goes through our discussion, talking about the totality of evidence. There still be people who don't believe us, who thinks, I mean, there are investigators in our own group who thinks that we shouldn't do this. They think we should keep the beta carotene, and that was it. I mean, there are true believers who feel that that way. So, um, so you know, we're fighting our own battle in our own group. But on the other hand, we think that if you look at the tally of evidence, that there is something there. If you drill down, everything fits in with for lutein cisanthine. And we, we're expecting a very high bar. We already have a treatment effect there of 25%. 25% on top of that. We almost reached it because it was 20% without the beta carotene. And even without the beta carotene, some of the nevascular AMD one, you saw that it was a 20% treatment effect. So, so we, we feel pretty confident that, that we are going in the right direction. We're drilling down. And I think the safety issue is very important. I think they're, in the general population, the former smokers are larger than 50%. So these people should definitely not be taking beta carotene. And it's so confusing for patients to go to a store now. You look at all these formulations, you have no idea what you're supposed to buy because they, you know, if you're in the States, I don't know what it's like it's in the same. UK. I'm sure it's the same. same yeah. Actually, I was in the store yesterday. They, they are the same. All these different things. What am I going to be taking? You know, you're 80 years old. You go. I'll probably take the cheapest thing there is, you know, because that's probably the best thing to do. Uh, and often that was not the right thing. And and some of them have just like very few, very little vitamin in it. So I think I think that was clearly our fault for doing that. We thought we were, you know, we want it to be a public health problem. So I'm, so maybe we haven't done what we're supposed to do, which was to alert the public on that. Um, I think if we went to another journal, maybe we start with archives, it might have been different, but, but you're absolutely right. We confuse the public ourselves, and we have nobody but ourselves to blame for it, so. Yeah, Fred, and then we go to the back. Please. I think we should have invited your non-believer team to conference here to hear our other speakers. Yeah. I don't know, Paul and I know about that. I don't think anything is gonna change their mind, right, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> So we have a question at the back, and then we have Dr. Howard, yeah. Can I just ask about the, the, the zinc? You found no significant difference, 80 versus 40. So why not just drop down to 40 milligrams? Well, that's a very good, that's a very good um, point. And, and the way we looked at it was because when you look at the hazard ratio, it did favor you know, the high zinc. And we found no significant differences. And then our long-term follow-up really favored that pretty well. We had a 20% reduction in mortality. Yeah. So what does that mean? I mean, we're not going to say we advertise it to you should take it for mortality, but, but certainly we're not harming people. So we felt that wasn't harmful, and that was the reason we went with that. I think it's fine if you're in a country and you only can do, give 25 or 40, do it. That's fine. Because I think if you take Centrum, you take another 15 milligrams, you're up to 40 already. So we're actually looking at 40 versus 95 in the study because 90% of our participants were taking Centrum at the time. So, so I, think it's, it's, I think it's reasonable. 
Yes, Dr. Howard. Um, in a form of publication, you were looking at uh, addition of B vitamins, and in recent literature, there's quite a debate about whether the B vitamins have an effect or not effect on AMD. I noticed that in your protocol, you did allow people to take Centrum. Right. And of course, that would contain the B vitamins. B vitamins, exactly. So, have you divided your people into with and without Centrum? Well, 90% of our participants took Centrum. So it's 90, it's 90. So it's like 90 oh, versus 10. So, so, the, so the comparison would be pretty lopsided. We did look at that in Eretz 1, which was two thirds versus one third. It made no difference at all. Uh, so, beta, so B vitamins are very interesting because there is that large trial done by Bill Christian at Harvard in the women's health chart a study in which they looked at the B vitamins and they appear to be a treatment effect. So I think that's actually very important for AMD. But in our case, you know, so many people have already taken it already that that is very hard for us to, to really tease that part out. Okay, we have a question up top again. We have time for about two or three more oh, questions. Julie has one too. Yeah, and Julie's. Yeah. Yeah. We actually did that already, and, and it also holds through. So, it holds true. Oh, it holds true. People who, who have higher dietary intake have less AMD at baseline. We've already, we actually presented that at Arvo a number of years ago. But that's also true for the, for the beta-carotene studies when they did the randomized trials for beta-carotene for lung cancer. If you look at the observational data, people who had lo higher levels of serum beta-carotene still had lower levels of lung cancer. So, so there is something that in that observational aspect of it. So we did find that, but, but the randomized trial is by far much more powerful. You know, that, that really looks at the, at the omega-3 because when you do observational, what's different about those people who eat fish, who don't eat fish? Are they taking their care, better care of themselves because they take better care of their hypertension or they eat other things that are important? So it's very hard to, to tease that out. And is the low baseline value also a risk factor for progression? No, this, this was just baseline. It wasn't for progression. We haven't looked at for progression. Yeah, You're right. The low risk, is the low baseline a risk factor for we haven't looked at that. We've only looked at, the, at, at just a, association of baseline. Association, yeah. Okay, we've a question here, and then Julie, and we've one last one over here, then. So well. I, I want to ask you about the race difference. The, more than 90% of, the, of your subjects are Caucasians, right? More than 90% are which? Are Caucasians. Are Caucasian, who are, yeah, yeah right. races. Right. And I, I want to know your opinion whether we Asians should take the completely identical formula of you, of yours or not? That's a very yeah, good I, question. I, I know we, we should yeah. do our uh, investigation by ourselves, but it's almost impossible. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, w I went to Japan probably about in 2003, and I, I remember, I think Bosch Alone was just launching in yeah. Japan, and they said, well, you guys are really small. I think you should take half the dose. <laughs> and that was what's been Economically, it's good. Yeah, so that's, I mean, and they asked me for my opinion. And I said, you know, I really don't know because it wasn't done in that population because we have a lot of polypoidals and you, and you, you have probably very less, I think less GA, but most, more polypoidal and some nevascular AMD. So theoretically, if, especially if you have, you know, we don't know how that, we don't know the mechanism by which this drug works, this supplement works. So, so it's theoretically, it certainly could be useful for preventing nevascular, but nobody has the answer. And I, I think if you want to do an ARIDS 2 in your country, that would be great. Yeah. But, but certainly at this point, you know, we, we, I do have, we do have the Chinese in our study. We have a bunch of Chinese in our study, not a huge number. Uh, and, and I followed a couple so far, and they still haven't developed you know, end stage. We follow from ARIDS-1. Uh, they still haven't gotten it. They're, they're on this supplement. So, you know, that doesn't tell me anything. But, but I, I think it's reasonable to consider it for, for patients in, in, in the Asian population. Julie? It's such a wonderful opportunity to learn the ARIDS uh, trials that I, you are continuing to, to find um, opportunity for that. One of those opportunities would be 
understanding maybe a more sensitive outcome. Yes. And I noticed that in a, at Arvo you had a poster, there's a sub-study doing dark anatometry. Yes. And are there enough centers or is there the, po that have done that in their, uh, in their particular sample populations or is there the possibility of adding something like that soon yeah. to a handful of centers? So, you know, that's a, so what Julie's referring to is our dark adaptometry study we've done uh, using something that Greg Jackson has put together. So instead of doing a, a one hour dark adaptation, they take a small part of that, they bleach very quickly, and just do this very short uh, dark adaptation. So we've done it in 140 patients. And what's interesting is that if you have reticular drusen, it looks terrible. It doesn't matter how, what you have. You've got, you may have just like a few little drusen. If you have uh, large drusen or, or geographic atrophy, one eye or knee vascular amnesia, the, our patients in that category will be off the chart already. They're really bad. So, so I think it'd be particularly good for the early AMD patients. And that's what we want to get at. My, my dream is to do a prevention trial in the earlier stages, and that might be a very good thing. So that's what we're looking for. Some of these analysis we're looking at, like OCT, looking at Drusen volume. I saw someone talking about Drusen regression. What does that mean? What happens to OCT? So those are all out outcomes, surrogate outcomes. But we need, we need outcomes for shorter studies. We can't be doing five, 10 year studies, which just is impossible. So we're hoping to look along the scale. We've done that. And there's some interesting things looking along the AMD scale. But all those things will be very helpful for us to, to develop you know, more clinical research. Because we don't have the money. It's going to be very expensive. We need to find better ways and faster ways of, of doing some of this, these analysis and clinical research. I think it's appropriate that the last question is to John Landrum. Hey, John. I recall a discussion that we had at Arvo, uh, must have been about seven years ago before, before the, the trial was, was being uh, settled in terms of dose, and there was a discussion about how much lutein, how much zeaxanthin, and uh, I think what we've seen today, hearing uh, about different effects of different carotenoids, and then thinking back to the distribution of lutein and zeaxanthin in the eye, zeaxanthin uh, meso and or argiazans and peak in the central part of the eye raise the question of how much effect is due to the diazanthin and how much is due to the lutein. And so um, what would you imagine with the, the knowledge you now have would be your choice for uh, a study to address the separation between these two components? Yeah, that's going to be very difficult. It's just like when we did the ERITS-1, the FDA said, well, you have a gamish of things. You're going to have to sort them out individually. To do that, you would need tens of thousands of patients at least. So the same with lutein zeaxanthin. We're talking about a small incremental effect over ERITS. So to really separate that out, you would need more than tens of thousands of participants to do that. And I'm not sure that's going to be worth the while for us to do it. Uh, whether there are other ways you can measure it, in vivo and if whether, I, but for my here, serum levels isn't going to help you in any way. Um, so there's some other way you can, some imaging. Uh, I don't think that we're going to be able to truly track down, you know, what gives what. And, and mechanisms are something that clinical trials can't give you the, the information on, unfortunately. And I think if you can do some basic science on it, perhaps that would help. But, but I, I think that would be a monument, monumental task to do that, to really sort the two out completely. Whether, and, and there was a lot of discussion. You were in on some of those discussions. And it was, a, it was a tough discussion. Like all clinical trials, when you decide on something, uh, and you're you know, like ERITS-1, we were stuck with it. And we couldn't change lutein. We couldn't change anything once you start down that road. Uh, and I think we, we had, I, I remember Martha was there. And we had um, Norm Krinsky. We had uh, Rob Russell. We had. A, a bunch of people who, who really try to give us the, our best information and we can, and we did so small dose study, and Fred was Fred Kochik, we had tried to help with that, and that was the best we came up with. And, and we were also concerned about the cost of it because we went way too above, you know, we, we knew lutein was expensive, and we went way up high, and we were, we, you know, we were doubling the serum level already. We thought that was how much the ERITS was doing, so we figured that was enough to at least perhaps get into the eye. If we went up way too high, 
we were going to outprice this drug that people couldn't afford either. So there was a sort of practicality of it all. And how much can you put in and how much can you, can you actually take? So compliance was the issue that we dealt with for the one gram of omega-3, because we went to two grams, it would increase it by two more soft gels, because we already have about six or seven pills that they were taking already. So that became part of the practicality design and how much compliance you would get for patients. So it's a good point, but I don't know how we're going to sort it out. I'm, I'm hoping that you would be able to sort it out for us, John, one day. So. Okay. Well, once again, Emily, thank you very much you. For, for being with us and um, for such an excellent lecture. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. <laughs>